Hey everyone, thanks for joining us this week on our expert interview series. And this week I've got an absolute expert of all experts, Greg Todd here. Super excited to have him on the show. Um, I've been following him for a little while now and we just got to connect and uh, I'm really excited for him to come on and share some of his wealth of experience um, because it's not too often that you end up having people who are so well, um, so well connected and so well built in terms of business from brick and mortar to online coaching and everything else. So I'm really excited to have him join us today. So thanks again, uh, Greg, for joining us. And um, you just kick off and tell everyone just a little bit about yourself for those of you who, uh, or for those of uh, us who don't know exactly who you are and, uh, and whatnot. Well, thank you so much, Brad, for having me on. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Um, so I am, uh, you know, as I said to you off camera, I was like, I hate saying I'm a jack of all trades because that's like the worst thing, you know, but, but maybe it's not, you know, I, I've, I've had a lot of experiences. Uh, I, I've been a physical therapist. This will be my 20th year uh, as, a, as, a, as a licensed uh, physical therapist. Uh, I have um, have had my own physical therapy clinic uh, since 2005. And we now have three clinics throughout the Tampa Bay area. Uh, I have been a consultant since 2009 and I used to, back in 2009, I used to consult for helping private practices start their Google presence. Uh, and, um, and then I decided to kind of move away from doing as much individual one-on-one -on -one private practice consulting to creating a network of physical therapists, um, uh, that wanted to learn, uh, skills that got me to the level that I finally got to instead of having to be that person just grinding away day in and day out at my clinic and just feeling like I'm, I'm stuck in mud um, to where I got my clinics to multiple locations, seven figures, you know, bringing in revenue every single year. Um, so, so yeah, so I started a, a, a network called Smart Success PT uh, of physical therapists and that network really grew from 2016 to 2019. And then I decided, you know what? These same skills are transferable to so many other healthcare professionals. So we, we uh, rebranded it to Smart Success Healthcare. And now we have 19 different healthcare professionals uh, that are in our community of over 700 and something people. Uh, and yeah, and then I have a, you know, a, a virtual staffing agency uh, that I, co-founded in the Philippines. Um, I have an online fitness platform, uh, you know, that we have patients using as well. Uh, we homeschool our four kids. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, it's kind of my story, you know, do a little investing, you know, here and here on the side with, with, with real estate. And uh, yeah, I've just done a lot of different things. I've tried lots of things, Brad. I've failed at lots of things. But when I do hit it, we make it pop. <laughs> so that's really it. You know, that's kind of my story. And, and, and today I just, I, I've just tried to use all the experiences that I have gone through all the experiences, um, uh, you know, that I've witnessed that I haven't even always gone through, but just watch other people go through. And I've tried to package all that to be able to help people um, and help them not make those same mistakes, but understand that they still will make mistakes. They just won't make the ones that, uh, I'm trying to help them avoid. Yeah, for sure. And I think you've, you've done a lot of stuff and you've got a huge track record, um, you know, with the uh, businesses that you've got. So um, I know there's a lot of people who are kind of starting out their own business and, you know, are looking to aspire to, you know, growing a, a higher, um, you know, multi six figure, high seven figure um, per year business. So mm -hmm. what were, what do you feel like was some of the kind of the, the main things that really allowed you to get that exponential growth? People, you know, I think, I think the big thing is uh, you're going to have to have people and you're going to have to have technology work in your favor. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we, we try to make this business thing so complicated, uh, but it's really so simple. You know, it, it really is. Uh, it, you, you have to help more people. <laughs> I mean, that's really it. You're going to have to help more people with bigger problems. And if you can help people with really big problems, you're going to get a bigger reward. If you can help 
lots of people with little problems, you're going to still get a bigger reward. If you can help lots of people with big problems, you're going to get the biggest reward. So, so I mean, it, like, that's really it. I mean, we can kind of end the podcast there. No, no, we won't end. We have plenty to talk about. But, but really, that's all it is. Uh, and if you understand that, then you realize you're going to need two things. You're going to either need more people to help you or you're going to need technology. It's one or the other. Like, that's it. And, and, and if you understand that the only way to exponentially grow whatever it is that you're having, you're going to have to have a combination of technology and people. And the quicker you can come to that realization, um, the quicker you can then start to act on it. Then you can start to ask yourself different questions. Well, okay, how do I get people? How do I keep people? How do I prevent people from being a pain in my ass? How can I, you know, do this? How, like, how, how can I, you know, um, you know, grow a business to where the people actually want to stay with me, but still empower them to leave me? Okay, technology. How do I clone myself? What do I do? do you know, and if we can start asking ourselves those questions, then you can get the answers. Uh, you know, the big thing is is that there are there are so many negative comic uh, uh, you know connotations to those two things that I just said. You know, people were like, oh my gosh, every single time you're around more people, they screw you over. You hear all these things of practices where the therapist comes in and then they end up leaving and they take all the patients. Oh, I have to deal with this. I got to deal with that. Technology. What if I start to use technology? Then it takes away my skills from, from the patient. Like once we can start to really address what are the issues truly behind why you don't want to embrace these things, uh, then you can really start to move forward. But really, it's a long, long answer to a short question. The answer to exponentially grow is you got to have people and you got to have technology. If you have both, you're going to kill it. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think like for me, that was one thing that I started to realize is like, you need to have leverage in your business. And the way you can get that is through having people and through technology automations and stuff. I remember like when I first started, um, you know, I haven't been in it uh, as long as you, but um, I remember like, you know, everything was very manually done, you know, and, and we didn't really get taught to think about other people. We were all, a lot of the people that I learned from, when I was going through school as a practitioner, we're very much like in that mindset, just do it, just do it by yourself, do everything by yourself. Marketing is bad. Sales is bad. Like, you know, they're getting into that mindset. So, you know, we're almost kind of fearful of like thinking, Oh, well, I don't want to hire someone and have to go through these problems. So, um, yeah. you know, I know that's a, a huge thing, right? If you think about it from your first internship that you had, you know, somehow, or you know what, you forget the first internship from school. You know, it's like, I remember when I was in school uh, and I even said that I think I want to start a business one day and have my own clinics. My professors crushed that before I could even like manifest it. They were just like, no, you don't want to do that. Da, 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 da. Make it about the patient. Make it about quality care. You can't mix business and patients. You can't mix business and healthcare. I heard that over and over and over and over again. So again, it's just, there, there's just, there's so much negative that we have to get away from if you want to exponentially grow, you know, in whatever it is that you're doing. Also, if you don't want to burn yourself out, you know, you need people, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, for, for healthcare professionals, you know, they have this heart that they want to help people, but then they also have the mentality that everything that you need to help people is bad. So they're constantly feeling pulled like, Oh my gosh, my heart really wants to help people. But then it's so it, like, because they don't have people, they don't have technology in play. When they get to that point where the schedule's full, they're like, Oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed. And then they sabotage themselves. And by the way, I did it too. You know, I self-sabotage all the time because I never had those two things in play, but that's really all it is. If you can get over all the negative facets of whatever you think, people will bring to you and what technology will bring to you, you will exponentially grow. No question about it. For sure. And I think like that also comes down to really the mindset too. And I think that that's a really big aspect. If you're going to go into business, whether you're just starting out or whether you're, you know, running a, a large seven figure year clinic, like the mindset is really important because if you're not really locked and loaded and kind of having that mental hygiene, then, you know, things kind of fall apart. 
Yeah, I, I think one of the big things is just understanding, like, what is your true identity? Um, and, you know, is your identity as a clinician? Is your identity as an entrepreneur? Is your identity locked up in totally being a clinician versus being an entrepreneur? Is your identity only an entrepreneur, not a clinician? You know, for me, Brad, I believe that um, I have multiple identities and they go beyond being a clinician and an entrepreneur. I'm a father, I'm a brother, I'm a son, I'm a fisherman, I'm a gamer. You know, like, I mean, like, like this is like that, like that's who I am, you know? Um, and once I started to embrace, and by the way, I didn't do this early in my career, but I have really started to do this more and more recently, is start to embrace all these different aspects of who I am. Now I realize it's not as hard for me to change. You know, it's not as hard for me to like let go of the clinical side because, well, my whole identity isn't wrapped up into that. I, I want to tell you this real quick. So in 2008, 2017, so 2017 is when I started to transition myself out of my clinic, like at all, right? And, you know, you have a clinic now that for what, 11, 12 years, you know, you're in it every single day between that clinic and my other clinic. We didn't have three clinics at the time. We had two. Um, but between those two clinics, it's like I'm in it all day. My identity was wrapped up into being this larger than life, awesome physio that could heal everybody, right? So then now, you know, I start to transition myself out of that. And then I remember one day going into my clinic and it was a Wednesday and I was, I hadn't been there in, I don't know, three weeks. And I went in there. And as I went into the clinic and the gym area was there, there's probably like, I don't know, seven, eight, you know, clients. Nobody knew who I was. And I remember that like really wigging me out there for a second, you know, because I used to be the man and nobody knew who I was until somebody said, oh yeah, he's the guy that owns the place, you know? And and I had to kind of go home and just like, is this what I really want? I mean, this is what I said I want. Is this what I really want? And I realized that my identity was wrapped up into being this, this, this awesome clinician. And then now I become an entrepreneur, right? Okay. So now I got away from that. Now I'm, I'm, I'm have this identity of an entrepreneur. I'm growing the business. I'm doing all this stuff. Da, 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 da. Uh, and then, you know, if a business fails or something happens in a business, was my identity totally wrapped up into being the entrepreneur, right? And so my point is, is that one of the biggest components I believe for success is to have multiple identities and don't have it totally wrapped up into just being an entrepreneur or just being a clinician. Have other things so that it's easier for you to adapt and change because you're not totally wrapped up in, oh my gosh, if this doesn't go well, then I'm gonna lose who I am as myself. That's, I think that's a really, that's an interesting point for sure, because there's a lot of people who put a little excess pressure on themselves. It becomes their identity. And then they almost kind of self-sabotage to some degree, or if something goes wrong, it's like they've lost who they are, or they become less at some point. And I've seen this a lot with practitioners that go into being business owners and not necessarily, ha you know, not necessarily having those skill sets that are quite, you know, being a really good practitioner is not necessarily mean you're going to be a really good business owner. Right. So, yeah, I think that that's a super, super important thing. When did you first start? I guess like, when did you kind of start realizing, realizing that mindset and the people and the systems? Uh, I probably say maybe 2010. And it was only after in, in 2010 is when I went through enough pain where I had to acknowledge it. So in 2009, uh, I had just finished, this is in July of 2009, I finished running my fourth marathon, San Francisco Marathon, came back from vacation with my family, and my body just wasn't feeling right. Um, you know, usually after a marathon, you, you know, it's like three weeks or so, you're just kind of chilling, you're not really, you know, running too hard. But then as I was starting to gear up about a month and a half later, to start to train for whatever my next thing was going to be, it's like, like if I felt like my, my feet were in, in quicksand, you know what I mean? And I just started to feel really fatigued, had a lot of problems. And then finally went to the doctor and this and that they said I had mono and then mono turned to Epstein bar. And then I ended up having all these other autoimmune stuff. 
I was getting seizures, all types of crazy stuff. And so by all of this time of me trying to figure out what's going on, seeing multiple healthcare providers to help me with everything that's going on. Um, I think that was the first time in 2010 where I, I, I had to like, I had to do something different. And so, and so I think the answer to your question is pain usually will open up your eyes. If you have enough pain, um, to, uh, if, if, if there's enough pain in your life, staying the same, you will change. Uh, and that's really it, you know? So for me, uh, there was enough pain that was going on in my life between mid 2009 to early 2010, where I had to say, Whoa, what am I doing here? You know? And so that's when, that's really when the team started to grow at that point, I think I had five employees total. Uh, in 2010, I went from five to 10 employees and, you know, uh, with the clinics. And then we just grew and grew and grew from there. And I s- had to step away from the business for health reasons uh, for a couple months. Uh, and then that's when I actually learned all the other aspects of what goes into running a physical therapy, uh, you know, clinic or clinics, um, such as building collections, et cetera, et cetera. And honestly, that's the stuff that um, I've taught in a lot of my programs is all the things that you don't learn in physical therapy school. You know, so, uh, so yeah, it was pain. Pain is what made me change. Yeah. I've, I've heard so many like kind of similar stories where people get kind of stuck. I know myself, like I've been, um, you know, I've had, I've, I, I sort of say, and maybe you, you sort of felt the same where it's like you hit like a roadblock and it's like, you feel, it, it's almost like there's like a cliff and you, you want to jump to the other side, but it's like a little bit too much. And you know what I mean? And you're kind of like, oh man, I've got to, I got to do that. So you know, it's, it's funny, I think as business owners, and, and I, I still know that I do it now where we get stuck in our own head sometimes. And, uh, you know, that's why I like to connect with other people as well, because it really, we make, you know, we make the gap seem like it's longer than it actually is. But really what we need is, is sometimes people to, to help guide us to look at it from a different angle, so to speak, you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. Um, let's go. The, the answers are there. <laughs> you know, this is one thing. I might not have the answer, but I do know that the answer is out there, right? And um, and I think one of the biggest things is that we're at that cliff. We see the other side. We know the jump is way too far for us to jump. But the answer is that you actually need to put on the shoulder harness that, you, you know, hovers you over, right? Here, I, look. The first time I realized this was at the age of nine. I was nine years old and I had just gotten my first Nintendo system. And I was playing this game called Super Mario Brothers. I'm sure you know it, okay? Sure. I'm playing Super Mario Brothers and I'm at level 8-1. Brad, I'm at level 8-1. And there's this part of level 8-1 where it's these little things, these little like, like things you got to jump on. And, right in these little things and i'm like oh every single time i keep on missing it do, 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 do. and i was like god i'm sick of this thing right i didn't have the answer now back then there was no internet and this and that whatever but if you went to your local supermarket there were these gaming magazines and i saved up money I literally over two weeks i washed cars i mowed lawns and i saved up enough money to buy this gaming magazine. And in the gaming magazine, it actually told you how to get through that part. You wanna know what you did? You have to run fast. If you ran fast, it just, you just went on it and you didn't, and you wouldn't fall off. And the truth is, is that that was the first time that I realized the answer is there. I just gotta pay to get it or I gotta seek to find it. And the quicker you can come to that realization, like I don't, I'm not in pain anymore over figuring out stuff. I just pay to get it. Or I have someone seek it out for me and give it to me. But if you're at a cliff and you realize, yeah, I can't jump. That's common sense. You're probably right. <laughs> okay. All right. You can't jump. You're going to fall and die. But there is a way to get over there. If you see other people over there, there's a way. You just got to figure it out. And you figure it out by talking to the person who's already figured it out. That's the best way to do it. 
Yeah, I can't agree more. <laughs> Talk to the people across there. But um, yeah, I think a lot of us, like even just healthcare in general, is kind of almost at that cliff's edge, especially this past year, right? There's a lot yeah. of things. Um, and, and, I, and I mean, that's, that's it's, it's been a very interesting year because we've seen, um, and, and no disrespect to anyone by any means, but we've seen, I know for me, uh, a lot of changes in healthcare, especially in Canada, and the reaction. There are people who get to that cliff and are literally like, I'm not going that I'm not doing this. I'm done kind of thing. And then there's people who are like going through, I, I, I know personally, like, you know, we've, we've not without our challenges. I mean, we're walking into, I mean, at the time of filming this, uh, you know, almost going into Christmas Eve before we've got a, uh, a 28 day complete lockdown of the province, um, which is going to change some things, but it's like, you know, there, there's people who are kind of resilient. I mean, you know, we're, we're still pushing through, we're making money, we're helping people. And I think it's like having that vision and really, like kind of with the mindset, having the vision of why you're doing it in the first place and, and having that as your anchor and really pushing through and taking action and just trying things. Like I know for me, you know, I don't know, I have some ideas of what I think is going to happen when I'm just taking action and some things have not worked out so well this year, but other things have. And I think what always really can't started to come down to was why I was doing it in the first place to help impact people to that's really what drives me. So if I'm looking at it from the, the core value standpoint of why the business exists and what my purpose is, it's to, it's to be able to help people. How do I facilitate that? And with that in mind, I'm trying different things and doing all I can. And it, and it's been paying off. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we now have things that are, I'm sure you do too, that, you know, didn't exist a year ago in terms of delivery of service because we've had to. So I think there's a lot of people kind of at that edge and um, you know, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? Oh gosh, man, that's, there's so many layers with that. Uh, you're, you're exactly right. You know, at the end of the day, when we get to that top of the cliff, it does look overwhelming and it looks like there is, uh, there's no way that we can overcome this or get through this. Right. And the truth is, is that whatever vehicle or whatever tools we have, if we realize, wait a minute with these tools, I can't get over to that other side. Um, uh, then I'm just going to turn back and just not try. And this year has presented so many challenges to us. For all of us that are in healthcare, um, a lot of the ways that we generate income is by doing services and being in front of people, right? And that has been altered to a certain, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, standpoint. So the reality is that um, yes, action like what you've done this year is 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 always the best tool, right? I mean, that's always, you know, one of the best, you know, solutions. Um, but I think that, you know, there's probably another piece that, um, you know, that you've done as well this year, but, in, in, and that is, and if you're having success and that is, you know, you're taking action on, on things that, you know, just make sense for right now. For instance, for me here, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll kind of take you into like the reality of my businesses. Yeah, I do well. And yes, I do have multiple streams of income from many different businesses. So not all of them have been phenomenal this year, right? My, my brick and mortar clinics are down probably 30%, okay? Um, we were shut down for what, nearly two months. Um, and even though we were able to stay open at one, I mean, our business went down like drastically. We went down 70% and then we've climbed back up to about 70, like, like probably up to about 75% of where we were before, okay? All right. But like we've, we haven't done great in that business, but for me, luckily I've had other, you know, different streams of income that have done really good. Right. So there's a couple of things. I'll talk about my coaching business. Okay. Um, and my coaching business, I decided, okay, my programs for the most part are either 3,500 up to 30,000. Right. And I realized like, okay, right now, at least when everything started going on, I was like, wait, wait, Okay. I know people are kind of freaking out right now, but kind of like what you said, you had to go back to your why, like, why am I doing this? Why am I charging people this? Why am I, it's because I want to help. I really want to help people. I really want to get more entrepreneurs in healthcare. And I want to give them at least some semblance of a, a blueprint to get started. So I knew that at that point, all right, maybe that's not a good idea to push those programs at this point, but I have other things 
ways that I can serve and help people that are either free or cost a nominal fee, less than a hundred bucks. And this year I've actually grown in customers by over 270% from the prior year. And we were doing just fine. We we're doing fantastic. But I was able to come up with other things that would allow people to come into my world and I can still serve them and help them, but them not have to make such a big investment. So, you know, part of it, yes, is, is action. But I also think part of it is just using common sense and understanding what is the landscape of what people are going through right now? And what can I do to serve them where they are currently at? Who do I want to serve? You know, if you're serving high level entrepreneurs, like fine, you know, maybe 30, 50, $100,000 groups or programs will work for them. But if you're trying to help the everyday healthcare professional, who's like, oh my gosh, I'm like SOL right now. Okay. Well, I had to meet them where they were at. And that's what I decided to do this year. Uh, and, and just try to meet people where they're at. And I think if people just understand that, if you understand that with your patients, just understand, like, meet them where they're at, you know, um, you know, with, with people in your community, just meet them where they are currently at. If you're willing to do that, like, people still need to be helped. No one's problems have gone away just because of the pandemic. Yeah. Not one person's problems have gone away because of the pandemic. And there are so many healthcare professionals that are actually uh, tricking themselves to believe that, oh, well, this problem, you know, their problem is not a big deal now because they got other things going on. No, 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 no. Their problem is still there. And if you can solve it, <laughs> it, it's, it, it is, it's, it probably is worse. So, so once you understand that, if you truly have a passion for what it is that you're doing and helping people, then, you know, we can figure it out. You know, here, I'll tell you this, just a mind blowing stat. Digital consumption has not only been matched, but it has been 6X between these times, ready? The beginning of 2010 to March of 2020 versus April of 2020 to this month in December as we record this podcast. From April of 2020, to December of 2020, we have 6X digital consumption of what we had in the last nine and a half years. It's crazy. That's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of uh, change, right? <laughs> that's a lot of change. What was supposed to happen in 2027 by 2027 has happened by December of 2020. So, as an entrepreneur, we see that as massive opportunity to be able to help and serve and make this place a better world. Other people that aren't willing to think and brainstorm see it as, ah, this is getting in my way. Pick which side you want to be on. <laughs> yeah. And I think what you said really like with the coaching and business and everything is it's, it's really about being adaptive and looking and seeing what the future sort of is. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, I, I see like what you said with, you know, digital consumption, you know, the people still have problems Their back pain didn't go away. You know, uh, people, <laughs> they're all of these issues that they have are only potentially going to get worse, probably because they're under more stress. There's more complexity and really what people need. And what I always believe people pay for is the probability of, of success, right? Like they're paying to, to shortcut and the probability, you know, that they're going to be successful with it. So, um, yeah, I think that that pivoting is, is huge. Like what can we do from a patient standpoint to be able to help facilitate? And one of the first things that I did, I was actually in the U S before, um, everything sort of shut down. And I, I remember, remember spending about two, three days and I kind of just took what Dan Sullivan, if you know him, uh, you know, uh, Canadian entrepreneurial coach guy talks about like free days, taking them off. So I was in Colorado with my friend, we went going hiking and I just sort of thought, was thinking about stuff and, and really thinking, well, how can we serve? Like, what, what can we do? And really thinking, well, if we get shut down, these people still have problems. So like, how do we, how do we deliver service as best as we can? And focusing on not it being less of a service, but being like, Hey, this is the best we can for right now. This is what we're doing over communicating. And, and I think that that's what you said, meeting people where they are is huge because chances are like there, there were some people when we pulled them that said, ah, I'm not interested. I'll wait. 
But a lot of those people ended up changing their minds after about two months of being shut down. So, you know, constantly staying in contact with your patients, customers, clients, whatever you want to refer to them as, and making sure that at the end of the day, you're doing everything in your ability to protect them and get them the results that they want, I think is a really, really crucial aspect as well. And that yeah. kind of sounds like what you're doing. Oh, I mean, totally. And, and, oh gosh, there's, there's, there's so many pieces to this. So, you know what, I'll tell you this. I was talking to my mom. Okay. Uh, this is four days ago. I was talking to my mom four days ago. And uh, my mom's like, uh, you know, as we're talking and I was saying something, she's like, okay, um, son, I have to get off the phone because I need to get ready for my doctor's appointment. I was like, okay, cool. And it was like 10, 25. I said, what time's your doctor's appointment? She was like, and I thought she was going to say like 11, 30 or something like that. She was like, oh, it's at 10, 30. I'm like, mom, it's 10, 25. It's, 10, it's in five minutes. She goes, oh, it's a telehealth. <laughs> now my mom is 70 years old. My mom's going to be 70 years old uh, next week, actually. Okay. And in March, if you'd have ever told my mom, she's going to do a telehealth appointment. Are you serious? Really? No way. In April, if you told my mom she was going to do a telehealth appointment, she's like, no, this thing's going to go away. I mean, come on. Did, did you not? Did you think in December we would still be even contemplating lockdowns? No, of course not. So the deal is, is that meeting people where they are at is understanding that what people balked at six months ago, they're no longer balking at. I guarantee you, if you're a physical therapist, you're a healthcare professional, and you actually reached out to your clients and presented them with an offer to do telehealth in April, probably 10% of your people took you up on it. If you were to do that today, I guarantee you that will be double to triple, maybe even more. You know, you, you meet people where they're at, but understand that people change where they're at. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so, so just understand that what, like here, I'll tell you this. And I, I just told this to, to one of my students. I was like, it's crazy how in 2015, when I started to come on the scene as this healthcare influencer guy, whatever, and I was getting crucified because I was telling people that they should do what I've been doing since 2004. And it's this thing called telehealth. I got crucified for it. Why would you do that? You're totally polluting the, 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 the healthcare profession. You're taking away everything. Okay. Everybody and their mom is trying to do telehealth today. So the truth of the matter is, is that I just had to be patient enough to just meet people where they're at. People are desperate. They'll, they'll, they'll do what you say. Okay. When they're not. And then guess what? A lot of people came to me because they knew, shoot, this guy's been doing it for a long time. I used to make fun of him. Now I, now I'm giving him money. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, so, so look, it, like it is what it is. Just understand you meet people where they're at. Um, you know, things are going to change. It's going to continue to change. I don't think it'll ever change back to what it was prior. Um, uh, but, um, but there's going to be a lot of people that are going to capitalize and win. Uh, and, and those people are essentially just going to help more people than everybody else. That's it. Yeah. Adapt or die, so to speak. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I also think it's like, there's a lot of market sophistication is also like grown exponentially. Cause like virtual, like I didn't, you know, we did a little bit of virtual stuff before just because people like kind of requested it. A lot of people couldn't in Toronto, you know, it's a pain to have to get across town and everything. So we had a little bit, but I, I never really, like I kind of admit it. I never really thought of like, uh, we're going to put a lot of emphasis behind this. So I, you know, we had a bit of a platform and whatnot, but I'm thankful that <laughs> we kind of did have something to, to, right, be able to right. facilitate, but yeah, the sophistication of the marketplace like can go instantaneously uh, like overnight almost. And, yeah. you know, you definitely need to be able to adapt. So, I mean, look at what's happening with the movie theater industry right now. Like this is the point that, that I, that I want to kind of just stress to everyone listening. The, the movie th- um, AMC uh, is going to be going out of business. I, I think they're shutting down all the theaters in March of 2021. I think it's going to be totally done, right? Uh, but the reality is this. Will the pandemic go away? Yeah, it's going to go away. Will we be able to go to the movies again? Yeah, we'll be able to go to the movies again. But what happened during the pandemic that's actually making AMC investors say, look, we're out? Here's what's happening. What's happening is this. Big movie producers 
people that already had movies that they needed to come out. And if they waited a year, they were going to lose hundreds of millions of dollars. They could not afford to wait a year. So what they did is they sold the rights to their movie to a streaming service. Now that would have never happened without the pandemic. It would have never happened. And now they're starting to realize, wait a minute, we can cut cost doing it this way. We can get this to more people. It's not as much effort for people to be able to consume our product because they can do it from the comfort of their home. Now, when you see a commercial on TV for a movie, what do you see at the end of it, Brad? Streaming on Netflix, streaming on Disney+. Plus. And so now it's like, oh my gosh, wow. You see a commercial, which is marketing, which is making you desire that thing. But then now I don't have to wait for it to come out in two weeks. Streaming now. Boom, I'm going to go to Disney+. Plus. Then Disney+, Plus says, you know what? We're going to raise up your prices from $7.99 a month to $21.99 a month. You don't have a choice. You got to keep it. And you logically make the rationale that, well, if I was going to movies, I would pay $12 for each ticket anyways. So, okay, this makes sense. So because of the things that have happened, we have to look at the trends of what is happening and realize that, yes, some things will go back, but most things won't. And, and we just have to be smart. I mean, that's really it. It's, it's just common sense stuff, you know? And if every single day people can just say, how can I help people like right now? How can I help more people? How can I help them where they're at? These three things are going to come up. You're, it's always going to be people. It's always going to be technology. <laughs> and it's always going to be, um, okay, do I truly understand what the consumer's problems are right now? If you understand those three things, I know we make this business thing complicated, but that's really it. That's all it is. Yeah, I love it for sure. And what um, I'm curious, like, what do you think are some changes besides like obviously delivering virtual based services for healthcare? Like, what are some things that you see, foresee happening in, in 2021 and onward? Uh, I mean, I know virtual is going to continue. Uh, you know, I'm looking at the problems. I feel like, you know, I, I don't know if this is as big of a thing in Canada, but I'm sure it is. Um, you know, there's more division and isolation um, than, than there's ever been. And I know that, um, you know, there was a study that was done, I don't know if it was the end of 2019 or the beginning of 2020, I can't remember, but um, it, it was basically on what is the number one killer um, uh, for, for, for people besides like i'm i'm talking about you know i know there's other things like covid and there's heart attacks and there's cancer and this and that whatever but um but they say that one of the the biggest reasons for decline in health and death is isolation and loneliness so i know that community especially if all the division of things that have happened um you know at least in our country it's been brutal um but I know that there's going to be much more of a need for creating community. Um, and if you can create products and services around building a strong community, a strong community online um, and a community that people can actually feel truly connected to, that's going to be another amazing area as well. Um, you know, uh, if you can create like what you're trying to do, a network, a network of individuals that um that can actually provide opportunities to other people. That's gonna be huge as well. Uh, 22 million jobs have been lost from March of 2020 to uh, August of 2020. And at least in the United States, only 42% of those jobs have been, um, uh, you know, have been fulfilled again. So we've got, a, we've got a serious problem here. And I know this, I know that, um, you know, every single time I've been able to either create an opportunity, uh, get a job, hire for a job, it, it usually is based on the contacts of my network that I have. So there's a lot of people that need work. There's also a lot of people that are growing businesses and need workers. Uh, and if you can create some type of community uh, around that, an, a networking group around that to help people, um, you know, link up with 
with, 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 with others, then you're going to do well. So those are some of the areas that I see um, that are going to, you know, capitalize in 2021. Yeah, for sure. I think that's super, super important for sure. And um, I know we kind of chatted a little bit before. Um, I know we, we were kind of talking a little bit about, you know, how you got a lot of things going on. You've accomplished a lot of things. Um, and I know we kind of chatted a bit about planning and organization and that being a really key component because there's a lot of people I talk to who have amazing goals, but there always is like, you know, we've got to have a bit of a plan to get there. So um, maybe share some of your experience and, and uh, whatnot of how you stay organized and, and keep all of these things on the go and focused and positive and whatnot. Yeah. So I, I you know, I kind of break it up into um, kind of three categories. Um, you know, I'm constantly uh, just trying to create self-awareness and, and the way that I create self-awareness is by continually asking myself questions, right? Um, I'm at the top of the cliff. I can't jump to the other side of the cliff. A lot of people won't even ask that, <laughs> okay? They won't even go there. They'll look at the cliff and they'll turn back. I will get there and just start to say, wait a minute, I'm at the top of this cliff. I need to go over there. I can't get, there. that's awareness, okay? That's the first part of what I always do. Now let's talk about the planning. The next part is that I'm willing to audit myself. I say, okay, what do I currently have at my disposal? Okay, I don't have a jetpack on my shoulders. I don't have an airplane. I don't have a helicopter and a rope. Okay, so what do I have? And that's auditing. So one of the things that I do is I'm in constant audit of my time, okay? And I break up my time into four categories. One of my mentors, Myron Golden, was the first one to introduce me to this. I don't know who created it, but it's a four levels of value. Have you heard it before? Have you heard no, it before? Maybe on some contacts, but- Okay. Just, you know. all, right, all, right, all right. So basically there's four levels of value that every entrepreneur, really everyone should be aware of, but especially if you're an entrepreneur. Uh, and the four levels of value- we should always be auditing of where we're spending our time in these different levels. So level number one is implementation, right? When I became a PT, I was an implementer, meaning that I was treating the patient, right? If you are a digital marketer, if you're building the funnel, that is implementation, okay? If you are a, uh, you know, a painter or a plumber, you are painting the house or you are cleaning the pipes, whatever the case may be. Okay. That's implementation. Are those jobs important? Of course they are. We need uh, cooks in restaurants. We need people to clean, you know, our houses. We need all those things, but that pays at the lowest level of value in the marketplace. Okay. When I became a physical therapist, my first job, I got paid $19 an hour, uh, US dollars an hour. Okay. Conversely, the next level is unification. When I was making $19 an hour, I was hoping to get a 4% increase in my pay after my first year. My boss gave me a 1.5% increase in pay. I asked my boss at the time, how can I get a higher level of increase? She said, you need to become a clinic director. So what is a clinic director? It's someone that oversees the implementers. And when you are overseeing and managing people, you get compensated at a higher level of value. You just do. So... A year later, I was able to get a 50% increase in pay, not because I did anything better as a clinician. It's because I went to a higher level of value and I became a manager. So if you manage the Tesla shop, you get higher, you get paid higher than the person that fixes the doors and creates the doors on a Tesla. If you manage a, a restaurant, you get paid more than the busboy or the waiter or the waitress. It's just the way that it is. So that's unification. That's when you're doing meetings, you're working with your team, okay? The next level is communication. Communication is when you are speaking to the masses. For instance, this podcast, this is communication. This is us hopefully speaking to 10, 20, 30, 50, 100, 150, thousands of people through one podcast, okay? That's speaking to the masses. Authors, actresses, Actors, salespeople, speakers, those are all great communicators if they are at the top of their craft. So I used to be a salesperson for uh, a newspaper company when I was 15 years old. 
I made $11 and like 30 cents over two weeks. Okay. All right. Because I sucked. I wasn't good at communicating the message of getting people to buy the newspapers. Conversely, I have been able to sell on a stage and sell more than $1 million in 90 minutes. It's because I've worked at that craft of communicating better. Okay. Stories, persuasion, this, that, da, 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 da. Okay. That's communication. And then a top level is visionary. Now, uh, I'm going to ask you this question. GMC, Ford, Nissan, Tesla. Which CEO do you know? Uh, Tesla now. You know Tesla. Yeah. Interesting. So you know the Tesla CEO, but you don't know the other ones. You want to know what it is? And what? And by the way, what's the guy's name or the girl? What's his name? Elon. Elon. Elon Musk. Okay. So it's interesting because you know Elon, but you don't know the GMC, the Ford, and the Nissan one. It's because Elon Musk is not only just a visionary like those people are, but Elon Musk is a visionary that communicates. He communicates on Twitter. He communicates and does lots of podcasts. He communicates through, um, you know, Lots of different interviews that he does on TV, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Okay. So it's not that the other ones aren't important, but he is a visionary and a communicator. Here, I'll give you another example. Apple, first name that comes to your mind, first person that comes to your mind. Yeah, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. But you didn't say Steve Wozniak. Steve Wozniak was the person that created the first Apple computer. He's the one that created it. See, Steve Wozniak was the implementer. Steve Jobs was the visionary. The people that create the ideas that are able to not only create the ideas, but then communicate the ideas to the masses, including their staff and their consumers, get paid at the highest level. And that's visionary. So I understand with my time, I personally, at least where I'm at, Brad, is I need to spend as little time as possible doing implementing and as much time as possible doing communication and visionary work. That's why this podcast is important. That's why me, uh, you know, uh, responding back to emails is not as important. Okay. It's because that's how I audit my time. So I lock my time in every single day of when I am working on my businesses. This is what I need to spend my time on. I audit it. I'm able to look at it and then say, okay, I'm doing what I need to do, or I need to audible it. It means I need to change. And that's how I've gotten to the point of, you know, doing a 70 to 80 hour work weeks down to seven to 10 a week and still getting the same amount of impact just because I spend most of my time at the higher levels of value and very little of my time at the lower levels of value. And that's how I plan out my days. Love it. I think that's super, super important, especially as you, as you grow, I've fallen into that trap myself as be, trying to be an implementer and realizing it, uh, it burns you out uh, very quickly. You know, one of the big things, Brad, is that there is a season for everything. Okay. All right. There, you know, there was a season where all I was doing is, is mostly implementing. Okay. But, but we have to understand when it's time for us to move to that next season. And every single time that, you know, it's time for us to move to that next season, it actually is not like summer and fall and winter and spring, okay, where it just naturally happens. We actually have to make ourselves move to that next season. So you might be an implementer in some of your businesses right now because that's the season you're in right now, okay? But then you have to be aware enough to be like, no, I've, I've got a business. I've got a lot of demand. I've got very little supply. It is time for me to hire someone to do this so that I can now move to being a unifier and overseeing that person instead of me doing the thing right? Now you're a unifier. Okay, great. Now it's like, wait, I'm in this season, but it is time for me to grow and expand the business so I can hire more people. That means I need to do more communication so that I can get my message out to the masses more, bring more people in so then I can grow the business, have more implementers, and then have the implementers that are already there move up to the level of unifying people. Okay. And then the visionary is, like, okay, all right, how are we going to scale this thing like crazy? Like, okay, okay, what are we going to do? You need to spend more thinking time. And then it allows it to grow. So now the unifiers can move to communicators. Now the implementers can move to the unifiers. Now you can bring in more implementers. Sounds great. That's it. Love it, love it. Awesome. 
I, uh, I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing all of these, you know, valuable, the valuable experience and tips and everything and simplifying it. Because like you mentioned before, so many people get stuck into overcomplicating what they need. And at the end of the day, it's, you know, we, we overcom- like to overcomplicate things when we keep it simple, we keep focused and we're able to grow. So I really appreciate you, um, you know, sharing everything here. You got it, man. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. And um, if uh, people have questions, they want to learn a little more about you, um, you know, how can they, uh, how can they get in touch? And, and... Yeah. Um, the, my website is gregtodtv.com. And on the website, you can find out a little bit more about me and about my kind of my life's work and, and, and how I like to help people, um, those in healthcare and out of healthcare as well now. Um, and I have uh, this, which is my planner that I actually created. Uh, it's called the GT Planner, the Get Time Planner. Uh, and, um, and that is actually available at www.vgtplanner.com. So you can get it there. Awesome. I'll make sure I link those below. So um, again, thanks so much for coming on, sharing your experience, giving these expert tips and uh, really clinical pearls of how to really optimize your business, optimize your personal life. And, uh, you know, everyone who's listening to this, definitely check out Greg. He's got awesome stuff and he's a wealth of knowledge. Thanks again. Thank you.